I'm going to review the phenomenology of humor, just so we see what, what has to be explained. Show how the humor detection mechanism works. I'm not going to have to do that in slow motion, and so that's not going to be funny. <laughs> I think it's important. And I'm going to show how comedy has been grown from this seed. So first, sketch the theory. There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. Oh, no, wrong picture. I'm sorry. <laughs> There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. You remember that. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. Their rooms were piled high with playthings and toys, comic books, fishing rods, and discarded toys, model planes, model trains, the dirt that goes with them, and huge piles of laundry that flowed out of the kitchen. And try as she may to get them to sweep, she'd scold them and threaten them for them and weep. She'd give them dust cloths and vacuums and brooms. She just could not get them to clean up their rooms, so she gave them some broth and nothing bread and took them all finally and put them to bed. Then she had a bright idea. <laughs> Swiffer broth slippers. And then she hit candy around in their rooms. And when they woke up, they found the first few pieces, and before she knew it, their rooms were just as clean as Martha Stewart's maid. <laughs> now, oh, a fanciful way of solving that problem. But we submit. Basically, what the little old lady who lived in the shoe did is what Mother Nature did in solving the humor problem. In artificial intelligence, we have what's known as the frame problem. The mind, your mind, is an anticipation generator. It's producing future all the time, involuntarily, all the time. As I speak, as you walk, you are always involuntarily trying to anticipate what's going to happen. How does it know which anticipations to generate? It can't generate all possible predictions. The number of possibilities is immensely vast, and we have finite computational resources. Neither can it generate none, or else we'll all trip over every stair and be smacked in the face by every door we go through. But what does it do? The right answer is to generate just those predictions that are most likely to be relevant to us. But how do you do that? This is a version of what's known as the frame problem. John McCarthy, Pat Hayes, first articulated oh, what, about 30 years ago. Real-time heuristic search. Unsupervised, approximating, and oversimplified. So real-time heuristic search means it's a risky search. It's governed by principles that we'll say a little bit about later, but the idea is it's a helter-skelter, time-pressure job, and it's unsupervised in that you cannot control it. You, you, the executive <laughs> ego, are at the mercy of your unsupervised search. It cranks away without any, you cannot <coughs> redirect it, even if I ask you. If I say, I'll pay you 20 bucks a minute to redirect your unsupervised search. And what happens in this risky heuristic search is that mistaken inferences creep in surreptitiously. And if these bugs aren't caught and debugged, then data integrity is threatened. You're threatening to contaminate your whole source of world knowledge. Debugging is costly, resource consuming, and attention demanding. The solution? The joy of debugging. Evolution has given us a reward system specifically to reward us from doing this debugging job, from catching the mistakes that surreptitiously enter into our, into the vestibules, the entry rooms, the antechambers of our world knowledge, and, and knocking them out before they get in to hurt us. Evolution has to bribe the brain to get the job done. Now, in order to understand this, we have to have a really quite radical adjustment to the computational models that brain architecture that are out there for cognitive science today. Because the standard models in cognitive science, they tend to be hierarchical and you might say uh, uh, bureaucratic. You have a high level executive that delegates to lower level executives that delegate to lower level executives. You have routines called the subroutines, and when a subroutine is called, it answers. And it may get to call another one in turn, but very obedient. 
very little waste motion and very little composition. That is not the range way of doing things. It may be how <coughs> ideal corporation manages its offices, but it's not the way the brain works. And once you realize that and replace all that hierarchy, all that top-down control with a sort of anarchic competitive system, then you realize that in order to get the job done of this debugging, which is so important, there has to be Dirty work re job reward machinery is in place, it can be exploited by self stimulation. Human beings have found again and again that they have reward systems that they can find in nature or in themselves ingenious ways of provoking, stimulating. Drugs, alcohol, tobacco, caffeine, sugar. What you're doing is stimulating the system that exists there for other reasons, but it's a rewarding system, much the same. So, oddly enough, we want to say that the humor system and the stimulation of the humor system is not actually unlike, well, you know, drinking or masturbation. It's a way of delivering supernormal stimulus to an uh, evolved system that was evolved for slightly more mundane purposes, but you can overstimulate it. And then once you've got this in place, and once everybody's sort of addicted to humor, then you can use humor for all sorts of social purposes. For superiority enhancement, that's the sudden glory theory, for allegiance probing, for many other things. For showing off, Stronger than normal response. 